Chapter 8 uh, involves our last theory that criminologists use to, do, to describe what causes crime. It will involve a discussion on social conflict, critical criminology, and restorative justice. Political conflict is nothing new or unusual. We have seen it in our country, especially in the la over the last couple, two, three, four years, uh, and other nations across the world. We live in a world of rife with political and social and economic conflict. Conflict takes many forms. It can lead to war, death, and violence. It can also lead to positive social change. Conflict promotes crime by creating a social atmosphere in which law is a mechanism for controlling dissatisfied have-not members of society while the wealthy maintain their power. There are criminologists who study and believe that the cause of crime can be linked to economic, social, and political disparity. We call those uh, critical criminologists. Critical criminology involves the politically progressive or radical study of crime, victimization, and criminal justice. Most critical criminologists are interested in how racial, ethnic, gender, class, and sexual orientation inequalities affect crime, victimization, and criminal justice. The major schools of crim critical criminology include Marxism, left realism, feminism, postmodernism, cultural criminology, and peacemaking criminology. Their critiques are centered on capitalism, stratification, and, and, and inequality, patriarchy, modernity, positive, positivist criminology, as well as uh, restorative justice. The origins of critical criminology stem back to Karl Marx. We've talked about this earlier in the semester, I think chapter two. Karl Marx's writings began or became the first well-known perspective on critical criminology. The gist is that conflict is inherent in capitalism. According to Marx, there are two social classes that exist in a capitalist society, the haves and the have-nots. The haves are the uh, bourgeoisie, as they call them, the capitalists, the wealthy owners, and the have-nots are the proletariats, those who have no power and are the workers, the large mass of society. They live at the mercy of their employers. According to scholar William Bonger, further described the ongoing struggle between the haves and the haves not as a natural consequence of a capitalist society. He advanced the notion that in such societies, only those who lack power are routinely subject to criminal law. In 1968, critical criminology really took shape when the National Deviancy Conference was formed, which called attention to ways in which social control might actually cause deviancy rather than just being a response to antisocial behavior. And then in 1973, Taylor Walton and Young published a critique to the existing concepts of criminology which called for new methods for analyzing and critiquing uh, and using existing legal processes. And come the late 60s and 70s in the United States, lots of conflict was involved. War in Vietnam, prison struggles, civil rights movements, the feminist movement, and this was all as a result of the ruling class as being a target for the criticism. Relationship among the law, power, and crime took hold, and criminologists began to study the effects. There's a number of works that are cited in, in the reading material, but these criti critical criminologists view themselves as social critics who dig beneath the surface of society to uncover the inequities. So contemporary critical criminology focuses on a number of themes and concepts, including economic competitiveness and the conflicts it creates, a widening gap between the rich and the poor, the income inequality. It's a major issue causing conflict. The rich get richer and the middle class and the lower class say the same. There's a great Netflix documentary called Saving Capitalism on that very point if you're interested. The justice system inequality. 
mass incarceration of the lower class. The elites control the criminal justice system. By doing so, then they can preserve their political and economic power, and they have eth uh, ethnic domination. And this can be shown because of the disparity in treatment of people within the, uh, the criminal justice system. And criminologists want to demystify, uh, demystify the domin uh, domination uh, by exposing this fact that the rich and the powerful run the justice system and hence they use it to control the lower class. We'll talk more about that as we move on. So how do they define crime according to critical criminologists? Crime is a political concept designed to protect the power and position of the upper classes at the expense of the poor. Some critical theorists include violations of human rights due to racism, sexism, and imperialism, as well as other violations of human dignity and physical needs and necessities uh, as crime. For instance, the supernatural criminology, and this is a fairly new study, in 2000, it began in 2005, uh, which entails a uh, approach to uh, a criminology uh, criminology approach to international crimes. These crimes are committed in a very specific political, institutional, and uh, ideology ideology ideological uh, context, including war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and other human rights violations. And according to some should merit more attention from criminologists and be a separate specialization. How this definition works is that the nature of society controls the direction of criminality in that the criminals are the products of society in an economic system. That criminality is a function of the social economic organization and in order to prevent crime, society must remove the social conditions that promote crime. Because those with the power control how crime is defined and the manner in which it is enforced, the crimes available to the poor are deemed, we deem them street crimes, quote unquote street crimes. Those are murder, rape, mugging, robbery, theft, and so forth. These are severely sanctioned. The middle class crimes include petty white collar crimes, cheating on taxes, uh, stealing from employer. These are frowned upon, but they're rarely enforced. And then our wealthy generally are governed by regulatory laws that control business activities, health regulations and security regulations, environmental laws. These are rarely enforced, and as a result, there's light punishments. We call those white collar crimes. And again, I know I mentioned that documentary a bit ago, Saving Capitalism. They touch on this too, this, this point. The rich are insulated from street crimes because they are so far removed from crime and crime areas. Those in, in power use fear of crime. How might they use that? The media nowadays, they use fear of crime as a tool to maintain control. The poor are controlled through incarceration and middle class are diverted from caring about the rich, corporate, powerful crimes because they're too scared about the crimes of the poor and the powerless. Unfortunately, it is the rich and the powerful, the white collar crimes that cost this country the most amount of money, billions of dollars versus street crimes. And that's per the FBI's. This, isn't the, this comes right from the official crime data is that white collar crimes cost this country billions more dollars than our street crimes do. So uh, next topic is gonna be the cause. We're, how, so how do criminal criminologists view the cause of crime? That's the next topic.